Thank you, Phil, and thank you and the other organizers uh, for giving an opportunity to talk here. Um, it's a great opportunity to talk to and uh, meet new experts in the field uh, that I haven't met so far. Uh, the title of the talk is related to my thesis problem. Um, I have been working on this problem since I came to Texas A&M University, and my advisor is Emil Strabe. He's not here yet, but I would like to thank him because this problem exposed me to different areas of mathematics. In order to tackle this problem, I had to see some CR geometry, classification of manifolds, like the Bishop School of Mathematics, um, some, uh, because the compactness is restricted to harmonic forms, you can, uh, I, I was exposed to some PD theory, and then uh, I've seen some mathematics just because of this problem. It was hard, but it was all beautiful. Uh, so here's the outline of my, my uh, talk. I will introduce the notation. And later on, I will, uh, just after that, I will uh, uh, list the re re results that relate to the compactness of the bar Neumann operator. This is going to be just a review of the literature. And then I will just take the main points. I will not, there's no way to cover all of the results related to the compactness of the d bar Neumann operator. And thirdly, I will introduce my thesis problem and discuss the similar problems and results that exist in the literature. And finally, I will list my results. All right, in my talk, uh, omega is always a bound domain in CN. We consider the L2 zero Q forms on omega. These are uh, those forms which are, which are written in the strictly increasing Q tuples and which have uh, square integrable components. Uh, we introduced the D-bar operator, the classical one. Uh, UA has already defined those. Uh, I'm defining them so that we can unlearn the twisted operator that just McNeil introduced. Uh, the bar operator is uh, taken here, and then we take the zk bar derivatives of the components uj, and then we just wedge zk bars with the existing j, j wedge products there. And we define the -bar, domain of the d bar to be the, those forms, zero q forms in L2, whose d bars are in uh, square integrable zero q plus forms. And we all know that the d bar defines um, a, a complex, so-called so uh, double wall complex, uh, on, the, on the space of zero-q forms. And because the d bar operator is linear, dense defined, and closed, it has a Hilbert space adjoint, which we denote by d bar q star. It's also linear. It has a domain of d bar star. And we define the complex Laplacian box q to be the composition of this d bar and d bar star operator. So if you feed, um, if you feed uh, this box q operator with, with, a, with a four, zero q form u, so one part of this box q goes to the next level, and uh, the one part of this box q goes to the previous level. And then with d bar star and d bar, you, you go back and forth. Then the d bar Neumann problem is inverting of box q whenever it can be invertible. And the notation here is that NQ is, if the inverse exists, the, in, the d bar Neumann operator is, uh, the, is called the, the inverse of box Q. And the classical result is that Hermann there in 65, after Kohn, of course, proved that the, the, this d bar Neumann operator exists on two convex domains, Hermann there proved that this uh, d bar Neumann operator exists on general in bounded two convex domains in CN. And he proved that. Box Q is unbounded self-adjoint uh, surjective operator on L2, and NQ exists unbounded there. There are, of course, some estimates, nice estimates out there, but I'm not going to list them, list them all. The, we are looking at the compactness of the D-bar normal operator because on smooth bounded stock convex domains, it implies global regularity. We are interested in global regularity for, for different reasons because this uh, box applies, uh, the bar Neumann operator has con some connections to, to PDE. And the global regularity has some uh, specific properties. Like, for instance, its global regularity is related to the global regularity of the Bergman projection, as Jeff McNeil stated at the beginning of his talk. So that has some applications, uh, for instance, to, to the extension of the boundaries. So we, we, we want to understand the compactness of the bar Neumann operator. Maybe we can classify this to convex domains. So this has been some, uh, some, some problems since, since, since this compactness uh, have been introduced uh, in, the, in the very early, early, early paper of Kohn and Nuremberg. 
So here's the historical development. We know that NQ is compact if omega is strictly stochomex domain. This is that this dates back to con 65 and then the, the famous monograph of Folland and Con. It's listed there. If omega satisfies property P, as you has you has stated that, uh, because uh, Catlin introduced property P in his 84 paper, and then he showed that this property P is not trivial. He showed that this property P holds on finite type domains there. And Siboni has investigated this property P uh, from the point of view of uh, cone of polar subharmonic functions. Maybe if you have read that, seen that paper, it's Choquette theory and then other stuff. But uh, the thing is that Siboni showed that, that this, this property P holds even for some infinite type domains. So there are some infinite type points, and they're not, they're, they are not too big. Uh, but still, uh, even in the case of infinite type domains, we have, we have property P. Later on, uh, Fu and my advisor, Emil Strabe, uh, proved that if omega is bound and convex, then the d bar normal operator is compact if property PQ holds. So this is the first example that we have the equivalence between property PQ and uh, the compactness of the d bar normal operator. And that holds if and only if no analytic varieties of dimension greater or equal than Q exist in the, in the boundary. And this last property on convex domains is equivalent to, to the non-existence of the affine varieties of dimension greater or equal than zero. Of dimension greater or equal than Q. Well, you can you can prove a, a bit more general theorem here. For the for the first three equivalences, you can claim that omega is locally convexifiable. This is also uh, this is also proved in this uh, Fu and Emil Strabe's paper. So if omega is bound that locally convexifiable, you can claim the first three equivalences there. Um, the next equivalence property in the, in the compactness of the NQ is, uh, is due to Michael Christ and Sichu Fu, where they proved that on smooth bounded hard domains in C2, the compactness of the de Neumann operator and property PQ is equivalent. So this was the second equivalence. Of course, uh, Oh, maybe, maybe I should say property P delivers and then make my comment later. So the property P is, is a sufficient condition. The next set of sufficient condition was, was uh, due to Jeffrey McNeil. He introduced this variant of property P in, in 2002. Um, and he also showed that, uh, that the property PQ implies that property PQ tilde, in the sense that if, if a domain satisfies property PQ, then it has to satisfy property PQ tilde. The, the basic thing that you have is, if you have a function that satisfies property P tilde, up to exponentiating and scaling, you have a function for property P tilde. But to my knowledge, the, the inverse statement does not, uh, we, don't, we, don't know the, we, don't, we don't know this implication yet. So this is open in general. Of course, whenever we have this equivalence between property PQ and compacts of the bar normal operator, we have also the equivalence of this. But in general, we don't have, we don't, we don't know an example of this. Finally, uh, my advisor uh, back in 2004 uh, introduced uh, a geometric condition in uh, in C2, and he showed that if uh, smooth domain omega satisfies this geometric condition, then the M1 is compact. And uh, his student, Samangi Munasinghe, worked on her thesis to, to generalize this geometric condition to higher dimensions, n is greater or equal than 3. And then they, they published a paper on this. Uh, so I'm not going to talk any more about the geometric condition, but uh, I just want to give a historical development about this. But we also know the properties when uh, the bonomer operator is not compact. So there are some worked out examples by Eva Ligotska and Steven Krantz. And from now on, suppose that omega is bounded to convex and Lipschitz. When n is equal to 2, analytic disks in the boundary of this uh, Lipschitz domains is an obstruction to compactness of the one normal operator. This is a folklore, folklore result, but uh, uh, is especially attributed to David Catlin. Uh, when n is equal to 2, we don't have this result. The inverse result does not hold. No analytic disk in B omega does not imply that M1 is compact. 
And this is due to Matthews, it's especially his thesis. Uh, and Peter Matthews is uh, Michael Christ's student. And you can take the proof that is pr presented in Fu and Strabe survey paper uh, for analytic disk in Biomega does implies one is not compact. And then you can just adapt the proof to claim that a minus one dimensional complex manifold in the boundary uh, also imply that M1 is not compact. So if you are working in the higher dimensions, you can claim that. And analytic disks in B omega, does it imply that M1 is not compact? This problem is also open in general. But uh, Emil Straub and uh, his student, Suemes Chahutola, had, had a paper in 2006 for a result in this direction. It's a partial result. The most important property of the compactness of D1 operator is that, that, that the fact that it localizes. So suppose that omega is just bounded to the convex in CN. And if for every boundary point P omega, uh, P, uh, there exists a pseudo-convex domain V such that the intersection is, the intersection is uh, a domain. What I mean is that uh, it's a connected set. And this d bar normal operator of this intersection set, which is a pseudo-convex domain, is compact, then uh, then the Dibar normal operator of the of the domain is compact. So if you can if, if you can take this uh, sets and then prove that the Dibar normal operator is compact for every boundary point, then you can uh, take care of the inside by the interior elliptic regularity of the solid, and then you can uh, you can deduce the compactness. And if if the Dibar normal operator on the big domain is compact, then and if U is a strictly stock convex domain, then the intersection is also does also have, has, have a compact de Bernoulli operator. So my thesis problem was: suppose suppose you have two stock convex domains, and that they intersect each other, and suppose that they both have compact de Bernoulli operators. The question is. Does the intersection have compact Dibar operator? So the second part of the localization theorem already tells that if you have a stock convex domain and a strict stock convex domain, you have the compactness. But in general, do you have the compactness? So that's the question. So from now on, I will set the notation uh, to be S is the intersection of the boundaries of these sets, and omega is the intersection domain. And I, I will assume that it's, it's connected. Previously, in the literature, we have the similar problems. Uh, Hanken, Jordan, and Cohn looked at the same problem when the level of forms is, is equal to Q is equal to 1. And Michel and Shaw, in, in their 98 paper, they looked at the omega when omega is piecewise smooth strict stock convex domain. So intersecting domains are strict stock convex. But they ask a different question, of course. Uh, and they update that the Dibar normal operator gains half derivative and the Dibar normal operator is compact. So it, 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 the picture is like this in this case. Uh, my advisor Strabe uh, looked at the same question, but this, this time he assumed that the omega is given by a piecewise smooth finite type domain. And he proved that sub-elliptic estimates hold. And uh, of course, the bar normal operator is compact. Um, uh, a student of my, my advisor, Mehmet Celik, looked at, looked at in his thesis a particular case of my problem. He, he, he assumed that the, the this boundary intersection S has boundaries. So there is some space in this boundary intersection. And he assumed that this boundary of this boundary intersection is given by the union of two closed sets. Uh, I, will, I will provide a picture so it will be clear here. So that, in a, in a sense, the boundaries are overlapping each other. So in this case, you can prove that the NQ is compact. So here's a, here's a, proof, uh, here, here's a picture for, for this setup. So when you have S, like shown as, as in the, you can think of this as a stripe, and then the outer circles are the boundaries of this stripe. But in this case, you can, you can prove this by localization of the compactness. So you can just put balls, and then you can cover the, cover the boundary of the intersecting domain. And these balls are just belong to the balls of the boundaries of the assumed domains. Or you can take a cutoff function, as Mehmet did in his thesis. And there is some space for that cutoff function to vanish in this on, on S, and then so that you can just sum up the forms and then claim the compact estimates there. 
All right. Finally, observing the uh, proof for uh, the proof of the localization in the Fuchstrabe paper. Actually, one does not have to take the strictly local convex domain there. In the proof, they use property P. So if one of the domains here has property P, then we know that the intersection has a compact D Raman operator. So you don't have to you don't have to assume the uh, strictly local convex domains in this inter in the localization area. So okay, here's here are the results. Uh, the first result is suppose that omega one and omega two are bounded. They have, they have smooth boundaries, and they are still convex domains in CN. <coughs> As usual, we are, I'm taking the intersection domain omega connected. And I'm assuming that NQ and NQ omega 2 are, are and I'm assuming that Q is, is less than N minus 1. Otherwise, and N is just a trivial case. It's a Richard problem. It's always coming back. And I am taking that as the intersection of the boundaries is a transversal intersection. It's a real transversal intersection. In this case, the d bar normal operator and n minus 1 is compact. And in particular, when n is equal to 2, this solves the problem when domains are smooth and that they intersect transversally. In C2, so here, here is the case. Suppose that these are smooth and we have C2. Um, this, this is a transverse intersection, smooth boundary, smooth boundary. Then omega ha omega has a compact even number operator. Uh, the question is more or less solved in C in C two, but there are there are things to settle down in, in the higher dimensions that I couldn't get the result yet. So you already provided the definitions for the uh, for the property P. So we are looking for a uniform bounded family of functions which have big eigenvalues, uh, complex eigenvalues in the in near the boundary. But let's go to property P tilde first uh, for, 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 the, for the next result. Uh, this is the definition introduced by the, introduced by the uh, in, in the monograph of Emil Strabe. It's just, just a, a little bit different than the, the definition that uh, uh, Jeff McNeil provided. So for every M, so we, we assume that there exists a C greater than 0, such that for every M greater than 0, there exists a neighborhood U of the compacts at K. And the functions, uh, see twice differentiable continuous functions, such that the, the gradient squared is less than the complex hessians there applied to the forms. And we keep the eigenvalue exceptions here. So, so instead of uniform bound that is assumed in property P, we assume a self-bounded gradient property here. So this is, this is the, so this C is not important because uh, in Jeff McNeil's paper, C is equal to 1. And you can always scale that, because you have the square in the left-hand side, and then you just have the function in the right-hand side. You can replace lambda by lambda divided by c to get 1, for instance. So the next result is, <coughs> suppose that um, omega 1 and omega 2 are bounded and stoconvex. I am not assuming any smoothness on the boundary. They are just bounded and stoconvex. Suppose that the intersection is connected. Suppose that the bar normal operators are compact on both domains. And suppose that the boundary intersection, it doesn't have to be a transverse intersection, it's just the boundary is intersection. It satisfies property PQ tilde. Then the D bar normal operator is compact. And this is, this is for all n. So examples, uh, when, when one of the domains satisfies property P tilde, but we don't have these practice, practical examples of property P tilde, so we can look at the property P. So for instance, suppose that the boundaries are smooth. And let the set of finite type points in S here in the boundary intersection with respect to one of the boundaries, either here or either here. And let k is equal to uh, be equal to this uh, boundary intersection difference than the set of finite type points. So that means k consists of the infinite type points with respect to both domains. So if k has property p, then nq is compact. For instance, this happens when, um, when k has Hauser, two-dimensional Hauser measure 0. So if, if there are no infinite type points here, then it's compact. If, all, if there are all strictly so, so convex points, there, then they are compact. So you can, you can claim more. And then in C2, you can work out the manifold structure. And you can talk about the complex energy points. But uh, I'm going to stop here. I already exit my time. Thank you.
Let's take our speaker again.